Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. So, Dr. Alex would be giving a talk on driverless anything and the role of LIDAR. Uh, he's the CEO and co founder of uh, EPC, Efficient Power Conversion. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. All right. Well, thank you very much, JC. And uh, let's talk about LIDAR. It's a, a pretty interesting uh, and relatively new field, but there's a lot of innovation. Um, so first, we'll, we'll go through the basics of what is LIDAR. Uh, we'll talk about how it works, uh, and we'll look at it from the signal point of view, from the various scanning methods, the lasers and the detectors, which defines all the system except for the software. Uh, and then we'll talk about how LIDAR is integrated into autonomous cars. Uh, it's a, 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 an incredibly innovative uh, area right now, and uh, EPC is on, uh, I believe, every single autonomous cars right now with our GAN devices. So we get a unique perspective of that. And then we'll look into the future and see where, where we think that's going. So uh, LIDAR, uh, this is, this is a, a simple diagram for scanning LIDAR, and uh, what you have is a disk that spins around on it, you have lasers and detectors. Uh, so a laser will fire a pulse of photons. Uh, keep that in mind, they fire a pulse. Uh, and then that pulse is reflected off of something and then it's detected by a receiver. Uh, and the receiver uh, uh, basically can tell you, depending on exactly when the, the pulse of photons that were reflected is received, it can tell you how far away the object is uh, and from that, you can create a 3D point cloud, which you see here in the lower right. So it's a very simple system. This spinning LIDAR was invented by a gentleman by the name of Dave Hall, and he first used it on uh, the ARPA challenge in 2004, where ARPA uh, gave a million dollar prize to anybody who could win a race driving through the deserts in California um, uh, above a certain speed off-road uh, with a fully autonomous vehicle, and uh, he developed it for that. Uh, and a few years later, he improved the LiDAR system using our GAN devices. Now, since then, GAN has spread out into hundreds of applications, and this is just showing you eight of them, okay, whether it be these, these automated uh, uh, material handling robots or vacuums, LiDAR robotic vacuums, which are being made in the millions with GAN uh, LiDAR systems, uh, these delivery vehicles, which I think will, will really get a, unfortunately, will get a boost from the uh, pandemic, uh, robotic security, uh, drones, everything you can imagine, and of course, autonomous cars. Uh, now, I'm going to show you here with the yellow um, uh, circles. These require short-range LiDAR systems, LiDAR systems that just see a few meters or less in order to understand what's around them. And these require long-range LIDAR, systems that can see longer distances. And those are different kinds of systems, and they have different ways of detecting and determining distance and, and creating three-dimensional uh, point clouds. So we'll talk about both of those. But realize that many of them actually use both uh, for different functions. So the laser transmitter for a long-range LIDAR is pretty simple conceptually. You want a very high current pulse driving a edge emitting uh, laser. And in this case, you know, tens to hundreds of amperes. And you want it to be um, you know, very few nanoseconds wide. Uh, if you can get uh, 100 amperes in two nanoseconds, uh, with today's detector technology, you can see about 300 meters with a, range, with a resolution of about two centimeters using this. So these pulses go shooting out um, and they get reflected back. And since you know exactly when the photon was emitted, you can you know, set a timer and when it comes back, uh, you just measure the, the, you know, use the speed of light to measure how long it was out there, divide it by two and you have the distance. Uh, and this, uh, this technology has been, been perfected to where, again, they can tell distance to within resolution, a resolution of a couple of centimeters. It's quite fantastic. Now for short range LIDAR, there's a different methodology. They use bursts of pulses. And these uh, bursts 
tend to be in the hundreds of megahertz, particularly for very short range. You need very, very high frequency burst of many pulses. Uh, and then it stops, and then it pulses again, stops, pulses again. And it measures the return set of uh, photonic pulses and measures their phase relationship to the original uh, set of pulses. So it basically subtracts the returning signal from the sending signal, and what is left is just the phase difference, and it uses that to determine distance in short range. They all use a similar circuit right at the transmit side, and I'm showing that here. Uh, and uh, you, you, in, the, in the center of this, you have a transistor. And in every single one of these cases, it's a, a GAN device from EPC. So we actually, in, the, in this case, since we're the only ones making this kind of device, they, they all use our device. Won't be that way forever, unfortunately. Um, and that transistor fires a laser, which you see with the red uh, um, lightning bolt coming out of it. Um, you need to drive that transistor somehow. You need to drive it very, very quickly. Uh, and you need a boost circuit to get the voltage on the laser high enough. For long distance lasers, they tend to use uh, 70 or, or even 150 volts sometimes. For short range LIDAR, like you, you might even see in an, uh, a modern iPad, they use just a few volts uh, to do that. Now, um, as time goes on, and, and there are millions and millions of these, We've also developed an IC uh, that does this, uh, this whole function of the drive uh, and sometimes even the boost circuit uh, so that uh, this, this uh, tight coupling between the driver and the FET can be even tighter by integrating it on one chip. And I know we had a question, uh, JC, from, from, uh, from someone in your group about the inductance between the, the gate drive and the transistor being a, a key thing to minimize because uh, that, that determines the speed of the device, which is absolutely correct. There are two very important elements in this. The most important element is the uh, inductance in the loop that includes the transistor and the laser. Uh, and then the second most is the inductance in the loop between the driver and the gate of the GAN FET. Uh, and by integrating it together, that inductance of the gate loop comes down to uh, you know, 10 to 20 pico henrys. Um, the drive loops of the um, uh, power FET and the laser are really limited by how the laser is mounted down, uh, and those tend to be in the 50 to 200 pico henry range. Uh, and the again, the lower the better. Uh, Alex, Alex, yes. Uh, Alex, sir, there's one more question, like. Uh, why don't uh, radars are being used? Because to find out the distance, why specifically go for LIDAR is also the question. So um, a radar uses millimeter waves. Um, and, uh, and as a result, the resolution is necessarily a lot less. The confirmation okay. of a millimeter wave is also much more difficult. So radar tends to radiate out and then reflect back and to interpret that into a, a signal that would be um, high resolution is very, very hard. Um, and I'd say a, a key example of that is you've probably read about some of these famous Tesla crashes. Um, and yeah. there have been a few of them where cars have actually, or, or the radar has failed to detect a metal sided truck uh, that's sitting right in front of it stopped. Because uh, radar can't tell whether that's a road sign or a big truck. So it gives you an idea that there's some limitations there. Now, LIDAR can see as well as or better than you can see. Um, there's also another advantage of LIDAR, which uh, many people don't recognize. Um, um, and that is that LIDAR is minimum required information for a 3D point cloud. That's all it gives you. It gives you X, Y, Z. So when you look at the computational requirements, it is a minimum with a LIDAR system. Uh, and interfacing multiple LIDAR systems can be almost a direct uh, integration of the information as opposed to you require a very complex graphics processor to interpret signals. Um, if you think about a photograph, it is a lot of information you don't need 
and it's missing some that you do. <laughs> so when you have multiple photographs that you're trying to interpret in terms of what's really going on, uh, it is a mass massive computational task. So LiDAR has that ability to very quickly. It also has an ability, which incidentally is, is um, in the human eye and our brain, we also have this ability. Um, if a LiDAR system fires a beam and it gets something back, say in say 20 nanoseconds, you know there's something 10 feet in front of you, three meters in front of you. You don't need a computer to tell you that. So in some of the LiDAR systems I'll show you, they have a immediate uh, reaction to anything that comes in less than a certain amount of time. They don't even use a computer to process the image, they just hit the brakes. <laughs> and you have that, that kind of an advantage. You can't do that with a radar. So, you know, the, the first one, and again, Dave Hall invented this, it's the scanning LIDAR. It looks a little bit like this. It's a spinning tub uh, and it has transmitters and receivers. Uh, it tends to um, have all of the lasers lined up in a vertical column uh, and uh, they all spin around uh, and firing all the time uh, and and that's how they create resolutions multiple channels of lasers all lined up vertically some of them looking uh, a little bit downward some of them looking straight ahead some looking a little bit upward and with this you can get um, and they come in 128 uh, channels 64 32 16 and you can get a lot of good resolution very fast 3D imaging, and again, the signal processing of this is the minimum. Um, then there is, and this is what I was talking about a second ago, there's this multi-channel passive laser uh, technology or LiDAR technology. Uh, here on the right, you see it, it's firing multiple channels at the same time. Uh, sometimes they, they stagger them a bit, but the lasers are basically just pointing in a direction. Uh, and so you fire laser one, and if there's a light, if there's a light return from that, you know it's pointing at, at say eight degrees to the left, and fire laser two, it's six degrees to the left, and two, and and in so doing, you can create a fairly crude idea of what's in front of you, and it's very uh, useful for obstacle avoidance. So if you look at these robots and or these like robotic uh, vacuum cleaners and drones, they tend to have this kind of a lidar system arrayed in a 360 degree array for collision avoidance. Very, very simple system. Um, that's what it looks like up close. Just multiple channels, one receiver. Um, then there's the MEMS LiDAR. Uh, it tends to use a, uh, a mirror to scan, the same function as the spinning disk. Uh, and in some cases, they use the mirror to do a raster scan. So you can actually use fewer lasers to create higher resolution but the image speed is much slower. Uh, and these things, this is again, uh, it's a big picture, but it's a, a, a tiny little uh, silicon-based MEMS mirror. And, and there's an example of that. Uh, there is the promise that that will be lower cost. And uh, there is the, um, the, also the promise that it's higher reliability, but I, I don't think anybody's really demonstrated those as facts. Um, then there's phased array. Uh, phased array is uh, very interesting. You know, you, you basically use the phase difference between the, the various uh, laser beams in order to create interference and reinforcement. And in that, in so doing, just like with the radar, you can steer the beam. Uh, there have been phased array systems. What you need for a phased array system is very precision alignment, obviously, of all of the uh, transmitting uh, lasers. Therefore, they have to be built basically on the same chip. And there's a an example of a phased array uh, LIDAR system uh, built on one chip. Uh, it has a range of, I believe, about um, uh, one, one meter uh, where it could detect. But still, those are all good techniques, and over time, I'm sure they will be refined for better performance. Um, the lasers themselves come in two, well, I'll say three varieties. The two that are used most are shown here. One is they're both solid state. The top one is an edge emitting laser. It tends to be gallium nitride based, uh, although it uses um, quantum confinement using different, different kinds of a heterostructure uh, grown inside there to actually confine um, the photons in a mirror-like uh, channel and then it uh, beams out of the side. Uh, these, these lasers are um, made by many, many people. 
uh, they're readily available, uh, and they are the most efficient at converting uh, electrons to photons. So if you want to put out a lot of light, this does it. It also has a pretty good collimation. So your after emission um, uh, optical processing is, is less. You can create a collimated beam that goes a long distance, basically. Um, below that, you'll see a vertical cavity surface emitting laser, or VIXEL. Uh, these are incredibly uh, interesting devices because they're made basically with, you know, the same kind of technology you make ICs, although obviously the material used uh, as a substrate is, is, um, is different. You can see that there are mirror stacks. I, I hope that shows up there, but those little black lines going back and forth. Those are photon confinement mirrors. Um, and then they, dr in essence, drill a hole into that uh, to let the photons out. Uh, and so the vertical cavity surface emitting laser, or VIXEL, uh, shines light um, uh, perpendicular to the, the substrate. Uh, the disadvantages are that the light is much less collimated and the efficiencies are much lower. Um, over time, that, of course, will improve Improve, although it is it is going to be very difficult to make a VIXEL as efficient as a edge emitting laser uh, because of the direction of the light being perpendicular to the um, to the confinement layers. Uh, so it actually uh, the the hole takes away from the efficiency of the laser. Um, that's what a uh, side emitting laser looks like when it's in a package. Um, this is a particularly good package. It's built with very low internal inductance, uh, and the laser manufacturers are learning how important that is. We're working with many of them on that. Uh, Vixels look like this. Uh, so they're actually quite exciting because they can be in even the submicron range, and you can get some very interesting quantum effects uh, with, uh, with Vixel arrays. Um, then there is the... Um, uh, the problem of uh, eye safety. And uh, this is the time to talk about it because the lasers, uh, these lasers are all in the 900 nanometer range, usually 903 to 905 nanometers. Um, and that will transmit all the way through your cornea to the back of the eye, to the retina. Uh, so there are significant, um, uh, there's a significant danger to um, uh, damage to your eye. Uh, and for that reason, there are all sorts of rules and regulations about how, uh, you know, how intense the beam can be, uh, you know, how, how, so it's restricted. It becomes a limitation that translates into how far you can see, how many photons you can emit. Uh, and that limitation, uh, I'd say in the early days, was more of a challenge than today. But as a result of that, some people have gone to uh, these... Uh, uh, these they're really 1400 to 1500 nanometer um, uh, lasers, uh, which are are their pulsed fiber lasers. They are far more expensive. So when you have a more expensive laser, you really need to go to a raster scanning system because it has minimum uh, number of lasers. So we do have customers that do 1440 nanometer lasers uh, for eye safety. That it, the cornea of your eye is opaque to that frequency. Um, and I would say that that, uh, you know, a few years ago seemed like the only way to uh, to get distance. But now people have become so efficient with uh, both the um, very, very small pulses that you can emit, thanks to GAN, and also uh, the, um, you know, the, the um, uh, various other ways of preventing the lasers from firing too much energy. So that I'd say the eye safety problem has gone way down in concern. So what is the research being focused on right now with Pixel? What are they trying to improve? Uh, the efficiency mostly. I mean, I, I, there's probably lots of things that they're doing with Pixels, but efficiency is the key thing. Um, we have some marvelous, marvelous, marvelous Pixel implementations of LiDAR systems. I'll show, in, in a minute, I'll show a couple of them that are really uh, amazing and, and I think will become uh, big, big things. Uh, they're already becoming pretty big. So then there's detectors, and detectors could be a photodiode. It could be an avalanche photodiode. It could be a Geiger mode avalanche photodiode. Those are the 
prominent ways of doing it. Um, and this is showing you a graph of gain of the uh, detector versus the breakdown voltage. So what happens is you get a diode, <laughs> and this diode is in various materials depending on, on uh, the frequency you're using. And um, uh, the gain of this device, as you bias it closer and closer to breakdown, it gets much higher. So folks, uh, if you use it just at a low voltage, it, it has very low gain. So that means low sensitivity. So folks are using it both in this near breakdown state, which is called linear mode, and then also in Geiger mode. And in Geiger mode, you can detect, in essence, single photons. Um, uh, so that's why they call it Geiger mode. Uh, the uh, In avalanche mode, it depends exactly how you bias it and how sensitive uh, your electronics around it are. Um, most popular is to use it in avalanche photodiode mode uh, because Geiger mode is a little too slow. The reset from Geiger Geiger mode is too slow for fast uh, image speeds. Um, so what's the value of GAN devices? I keep talking about uh, you know, EPC's eGAN devices. We Again, we're in 100% of these LiDAR systems. Uh, and in long range LiDAR, the advantage is you can get a very small um, uh, device that gives you very, very high peak current. Um, and small is important because it really needs to be right up against the laser. You don't have any, uh, it, there, you, you've got to keep uh, PCB traces to an absolute minimum. You couldn't possibly have a package because packages have more inductance, an order of magnitude more inductance than we have in our final system. Uh, and also GAN is very, very, very fast compared to uh, silicon. It's about a hundred times faster than silicon. So you can get these very high peak currents with very short pulse widths. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. With short range LIDAR, remember those are those 100 megahertz or 200 megahertz bursts of, uh, of, uh, of uh, energy photons uh, that you see in, we call them time of flight or indirect time of flight cameras. Uh, the, the advantage is very small size and very high frequency capability. And, and again, the high frequency is similar to very, very fast, but not exactly the same as that. And, but GAN has both. Uh, and also EGAN, uh, or, or GAN in general, uh, is very simple to integrate. And uh, by doing that, you, you increase the speed, you reduce the cost, and, and of course you reduce the size of the system, which is more important in that it reduces the uh, power loop inductance than reducing the overall size of the LiDAR, which, which is not a big factor right now. So here is today's state of the art. Um, this is showing you a laser pulse, and the yellow trace is the, um, the current that goes into the laser. Uh, and very tricky to measure these things, by the way. Um, and this is showing a peak current of 135 amperes, and it has a a pulse width of two and a half nanoseconds. Uh, and the optical pulse is 2.85 nanoseconds. So you can see the optical pulse in blue there uh, that um, is basically, you know, we're, we're picking up the return from the light being fired away. It's, I don't know, maybe a nanosecond um, uh, away, which means it's uh, half a meter away, or uh, it's, it's half a foot away. It's a foot of nanometer, so it's about a half a foot away, six inches away. Uh, we also make dual channel ICs that integrate uh, the uh, drivers with the power FETs. Um, that is uh, a proprietary device, so I can't show you the waveform, but it is superior to this one. Uh, so folks are, are definitely understanding that you need to come up with integrated circuits to, uh, to get to the next level of refinement of, GAN, of LiDAR. This is a short range LIDAR, and as I said, we call that ITOF or indirect time of flight measurement. This is running at 200 megahertz. The, um, the input voltage here is uh, about 1.8 volts, so it's being driven just off a logic gate, a very high speed logic gate, which is extremely convenient because you know, your graphics processor uh, can just drive this thing and then receive the signal and coordinate the phase relationship very easily. Um, your, it's, it's a, uh, um, uh, it's running at nine amperes. Look at the one on the right. That's uh, 20 volts 
bias across the, the laser and across the device, uh, and it fires a nine ampere pulse, and the rise and fall time in this case is um, a, a 350 picosecond rise and 250 Alex, picosecond um, fall time. Yes? Alex, attended talking in the previous slide, how, how are you measuring that 100, yeah, 100 odd ampere? equipment? Um, so we have um, a multi gigahertz scope and a multi gigahertz probe, which is the hard thing to do. Um, and then we use an array of uh, very carefully designed resistors. You can you can buy this this uh, demo board. It's the EPC 9126HC uh, demo board, um, and uh, it you it 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 organizes all of these signals so that you can use a high-speed scope to measure them. Uh, and the, the resistor, just the resistor technology to create a, the ability to measure uh, the, um, the, the current without distorting the system uh, is, is quite amazing. Uh, and I won't get into it, but, but we've organized all that so that the added inductance of the uh, measurement system is in the very, very low, um, you know, 10 or so pico Henry range. Yeah, because that is a 135 amps is a big challenge to measure that. In you have it like four nanosecond within four nanosecond. Oh no, this is a two and a half nanosecond pulse width. So we're resolving here, you know, uh, half a nanosecond easily, um, uh, probably quarter nanosecond easily. Um, the the world record on this, which is uh, a uh, Pico test, is the company. Steve Sandler is the CEO of that, and he specializes in figuring out how to measure these things. And and he can measure. I believe now he can measure 100 amps in 140 picoseconds. Uh, and um, anyway, we we work with him very closely to get some of these things. And and again, we we integrate this into our demo boards. So that you don't have to worry about it, but you still need a high-speed scope to uh, to be able to see this. Uh, and and you know, 10 amps in in a couple of hundred picoseconds is also pretty hard. The bandwidth of the system uh, that we're using uh, in this case, two gigahertz probes, and um, I think it's a five or so gigahertz um, scope. So a two gigahertz probe, I think, has a, a bandwidth of somewhere around 150 or so picoseconds. And that's the IC. That's what it looks like a little bit up close. Uh, these are, we have a family of these that we're planning to launch in November. Uh, so the, this, is, this is just showing you the images from our testing lab right now. Um, so how do we get from where we are to self-driving cars? Um, I, I am highly opinionated in that area, so if you want to pick my brain on my opinion, I'm happy to do it. Um, there's, you know, five levels of automation, starting with cars like we, you know, when I was a kid, <laughs> which is zero, and that means the driver does everything. Uh, and then you get, uh, you know, more and more of these level one cars that has, you know, out of lane, uh, you know, warnings and, and things like that, and then you get partly automated system. Then you get this level three, which is highly automated, and that need, means that the driver doesn't have to continuously monitor the systems. The most advanced cars out there um, are level three. To give you an example of what that means, the most advanced Tesla is a level two. Uh, so there are only a couple of level three cars that you can you can buy if you want to. Uh, one is an Audi A8 uh, in Europe. Uh, they do not import it into the U.S. The other one is a Cadillac. Uh, Cadillac is a level three system. Uh, and then a level four system is fully automated. That means you don't need to have a driver uh, technically, um, but uh, it, you, you do have the ability to drive the car without automation. Uh, and then level five is a car that has no uh, way for someone to drive it. It drives itself or it doesn't drive. Um, there is a philosophy uh, on, on these things. Uh, if you, you know, Google Waymo had the philosophy, which I think is probably a smart one, and they said, do not fiddle with drivers, go to driverless. Um, and then 
other people are fiddling with drivers, so they're going up, you know, level two, level three, uh, and that's that's probably one of the big reasons why why um, well, it's not a big reason, but it, that's going to be a very difficult path, adding a lot of cost, uh, and um, we can talk about that if you want, but there's a lot of stuff involved in that that's difficult. It's, it's all difficult, but uh, but I think that may be a path that is um, uh, more niche than people think. Um, so what's required for an autonomous car? Well, you need to be able to see about 300 meters, which is you know how far a car drives in about 11 seconds at 60 miles per hour. Uh, and 11 seconds is enough time to take evasive measures, enough time to, uh, tr to hit your brakes, enough time to do lots of things, uh, but you don't have a lot of time. So 300 meters is what they said on that. Um, so ways of doing it. As we talked earlier, you can go to higher output lasers by, you know, like 1440 nanometers, uh, so you can have higher power, which takes away some of the burden of, uh, of you know, detecting small numbers of photons, uh, but that's more expensive. Uh, edge emitting LEDs are more efficient uh, than pixels, and they have superior collimation, um, but they're they're also fairly expensive. And I would say that. In the last couple of years, there's been a lot of improvement in uh, LED technology uh, and packaging technology to where I, I do think that the, the 1440 nanometer solution is probably becoming uh, less likely as a dominant mechanism. It might still become specialized. Maybe it'll be required on, on heavy equipment, uh, you know, working in strange conditions or something. Um, and uh, you need more sensitive detectors. Uh, as I said, Geiger mode can detect single photons, but they take time to reset. There's a lot of work being done on, on detectors and a lot of good work. Uh, so without going into Geiger mode, they can still sense just a couple of photons. As a matter of fact, it's pretty routine now to have these photodiodes uh, detecting uh, two photon returns. Uh, Geiger mode can, can detect single photon returns. This is how a self-driving car sees. This is Waymo. Uh, and um, they they have I guess a bunch of these Chrysler vans that they uh, that they built. Uh, they have radar sensors you can see. They have uh, um, a front looking scanning uh, 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 scanning lidar. They have a top spinning lidar. Um, they have lots of cameras. <laughs> uh, and um, so they're really combining cameras. Uh, radar, LIDAR, um, all, all together integrated with a very, very high-speed graphic processor. As a matter of fact, these, these little ones in the front, if you can see near the, uh, let me see if I can get a, I can't here, but um, it won't let me. But if you look near the side view mirror in front of it, you'll see another bulge, and there's a little LIDAR unit there as well. Uh, so they have them in the front uh, in three locations on the top, Inside that that uh, big thing on the roof, they have all of the uh, signal processing uh, uh, equipment. It's NVIDIA-based, um, and then they have a, an array of cameras that are looking forward as well. Um, this is how the, uh, as I said, there were only a couple of uh, ADAS3 cars actually on the road. This is one of them. It's the A8, uh, and uh, each one of those uh, German words is a sensor of some sort. Uh, they they just this is an example of um, extreme censoring of a car in order to make it as autonomous as possible, and that is a philosophy. It's a philosophy that comes at a cost. Cost is if you have more sensors, it takes a lot more processing to understand what the sensors are saying, and that causes a latency. So the, the uh, decision takes longer because it's integrating more information and having to process the information before it can come to a decision. Uh, so that, that is a philosophy that drives you down the path of faster and bigger processors. Uh, that is also the Tesla philosophy. They do not use uh, LiDAR because they say with infinite processing capability, uh, we don't need LiDAR because we can we can get um, good information from all the other sensors. Uh, so that's a, I'll say, a, a mini dispute right now. We'll see who, who winds up in the end. Uh, 
Um, I, I would have a hard time voting against Elon Musk, but I do disagree with him in this case. Um, so this is, I mean, so this is a real world example. These are driving on the road and they're doing just fine. Um, what they don't show you is that one of the things that they discovered is when you have an ADAS3 system, which means the driver has to basically be there in an emergency, is that drivers fall asleep. <laughs> they do not stay awake when they're going down a road at night and they're tired and the car is doing everything for you. And there have been accidents because of that. So now there's another uh, um, LiDAR system that's been added to these things, and that is one that sits inside the cabin and looks at your face. And it interprets from your face whether or not you are alert and looking forward. And if, if you're not, it, it uh, shuts down the automation. So uh, we're learning a lot. This is um, how a LiDAR system might be deployed. This is an actual LiDAR scan from a roof mounted uh, spinning lidar system so you can see you know as you know as, you know as the car drives down the road it scans uh, this is a 32 channel lidar image so if you had 128 the lines would be tighter together but basically they're tight enough so that you can see just about anything all the way out to 300 meters but you'll also notice by using a single spinning lidar on your roof you have a shadow zone Okay, and that shadow zone needs to be filled, so you need other sensors. You can't just glue a spinning sensor on the top of your car and say, I'm done. Um, so what else do you need? So here is a way to fix that problem, which um, I think is gaining some popularity. So I've drawn the car now, top view. There's the LiDAR on the roof, and I'm uh, you know, putting the arrow to the shadow zone. How do you fill that shadow? And you can do it with flash LiDAR units. Uh, flash LiDAR units are really, conceptually, they're no more expensive than the camera on your phone. Uh, they use a Vixel as a flash bulb. Uh, and uh, why do you need a Vixel as a flash bulb? Because the Vixel can be flashed with a nanosecond pulse. You can use those um, indirect time of flight pulses. Uh, and then you can use a, re I'll say a regular, but infrared sensitive camera chip that can receive those light pulses and interpret the 3D image, either as an individual uh, pulse, like the direct time of flight, or in an indirect time of flight. And you get high resolution images uh, very quickly uh, and very inexpensively, plus they can replace uh, two sensors on your car, your camera and your ultrasonic sensor with the same unit. LiDAR myths, uh, I hear these all the time. LiDAR can't see in fog, snow, or rain. Well, uh, it can see better than we can <laughs> in fog, snow, or rain. So I, I want to ask the question, do you want an autonomous car driving around in fog, snow, or rain where you can't even see? And the answer is probably not. And if you do want a car in those conditions, then you probably want a radar system on top. But let's not do that. <laughs> let's not do that right away. Maybe we'll do it when all cars are autonomous, but right now, I don't think you want to do that. So that's kind of a, I'll, I'll put that in the myth category. Spinning disc LiDAR is unreliable. I hear that all the time. You know, we need to go solid state because spinning discs are unreliable. Well, think about a car and think about how many spinning discs there are on a car right now. And they are all very reliable. So you make spinning discs reliable. I've worked on, uh, on car electronics now for over 40 years. And uh, I, I know that that can be fixed. <laughs> And it's not really a problem today. I, as a matter of fact, I don't know of a single LiDAR unit that's failed because of the spinning disk uh, uh, right now. And, and then the final myth, uh, LiDAR is too expensive. And flash LiDAR, as I said, is much less expensive than a spinning LiDAR system. But they have really different functionality. But also, car companies have a way of grinding down cost. I, I worked in the uh, 1979. I started working on the first anti-lock brakes for cars. And the first systems introduced in 1983 cost $2,000 US per wheel, which, you know, everybody said that's too expensive, but airplanes use them and uh, big trucks use them. And then finally, expensive cars use them. And today it costs $5 a wheel. So automotive companies have this wonderful way uh, of grinding down costs, very huge volumes, very good engineering. Uh, and, and LiDAR is, is easily 
uh, going to be uh, much, much less expensive than, than people can imagine today. So in the future, LiDAR will be used, in my opinion, on all cars. And of course, lots of robots and UAVs as well. It'll be as, about as expensive as a headlamp. Uh, it has about the same uh, intrinsic material content as a headlamp. Uh, and scanning LiDAR and flash LiDAR plus cameras uh, can, can handle most autonomous functions, and, and as I mentioned, except if you want to really drive something uh, in, in very strange conditions. Um, and you can learn more. We wrote a book, a uh, textbook. I don't know if you, uh, if you have it or use it, but this is a peer-reviewed John Wiley produced textbook on GAN transistors uh, and how to build them and also their applications. Um, I'm one of the authors. Uh, we have a video series, uh, uh, tens of videos now on our website, uh, everything from layout to driving FETs to uh, how to use them in motor drives and, and Class D audio amplifiers. Um, the picture here in the lower right is the evaluation kit for LiDAR. Uh, and you can actually get right to the state of the art by getting one of these evaluation kits. because This is the narrowest, highest pulse uh, known to man at this point. And then, of course, we have, you know, hundreds of, of FETs and ICs on our website for sale as well. And that's it. So I want to thank you all and take thank your thank questions. You and take your questions. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So let me read out the question. There's some audio problem. So in one of the slides, uh, you showed that Audi uh, had the LiDAR near the number plate. And in some cases, they were at different location. Is the location, uh, does it play a role? That's what the question is. Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, and yes, location does play a role. Um, so some people, I, I, I always say that there are three business models uh, for autonomous driving. One business model is I want to sell more cars, and therefore I'm going to add features. I'll call that the Tesla model or the Audi model. The second business model is I want to get rid of drivers because drivers cost me too much, and that would be like an Uber model or, you know, uh, I don't know, any taxi system will have that model. Um, and truck drivers and stuff like that. The third model is I want to own the data, and that's the Google model. Google, of course, wins. <laughs> but if you want to replace a driver, um, then you, you get the most efficient, lowest cost system, and that is a spinning LiDAR on your roof and flash LiDARs on the side and cameras. That's the cheapest way to do it. If you want to sell more cars, you need it to look good. And so um, the scanning uh, LIDARs, as opposed to spinning, are meant to sit inside the bodywork so it looks clean to the, uh, to the, guy, to the person buying the car. Um, and, but the, the disadvantage of a scanning LIDAR is that it has a lower um, angular uh, uh, reach. So it, it can maybe go you know, 120 degrees. So you need to position more of them around your car in order to get a 360 degree view. Uh, so some people will just use it for front looking, in which case, like Audi, just has one in the front looking forward. Um, other, other people will locate, um, say, uh, two or even three in the front, in the side view mirrors, and also in the front. And then they'll have either one or two in the rear. Uh, and then they'll use other sensors for blind spot detection. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have some more questions. Yeah, when I, if you are using two or more lidars, uh, won't there be any interference? That is what the question is. Um, so I think the, the, it's a very good question, by the way. And I think the question is: Let's say you're walking down the street, and all cars have lidar systems flashing along. Okay, so mm -hmm. the two questions that come from that. Does it confuse the LiDAR system? And the second question is, does it cause an eye safety problem? Uh, so those, those are two questions which, which should be asked and, and are asked a lot. So what we do in the LiDAR systems today, all of our customers do this, is they actually encrypt 
the uh, signal. They use a pulse train, even for the uh, uh, direct time of flight, they will put like a key code in the uh, pulse train so that they know that they need to read, uh, it's almost like Morse code, beep, 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 or the next time it's beep, 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 and uh, that way they can make sure that the signal is good. Uh, it, it adds some complexity, uh, but it's, it, it's the way you can avoid people shining a laser, light or, your, or a laser at your car and confusing it. Um, in the, uh, the eye safety thing, uh, it's still being worked out uh, as to how to deal with that. But the, the basic thing is that your eye can only see a certain angle uh, um, and can only receive light at a certain angle. And the danger to you is different at the different angles. So in a practical reality, unless there are 100 cars coming straight at you, flashing their light or right in your eyes, you don't have a real issue with that. But it does need to be sorted out a little bit more. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mohana Piriya, you're unmuted. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can you hear us? Uh, Mohana, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. There is some issue. Uh, there is one more question. Yeah, about the snow and rain as well. So how does it uh, let's say you have snow, heavy snow. Uh, how do how do you because you have objects right in your field of vision. So how does the lidar uh, try to eliminate that if there is heavy snow? Yeah, so um, it's a uh, it's an interest. There's there's both a um, I'll say an analog way and a digital way to to, to deal with that. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen some of the lidar images from aircraft flying over, um, you know, uh, architectural sites or, or um, uh, archaeological sites. You've seen those. They're very interesting. Um, so one of the ways that they, uh, one of the things that they're doing right now is they're flying aircraft over the jungles of Central America, and they're finding these ruins underneath the canopy of the trees. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar challenge. Um, what you get is a lot of uh, a lot of the basically the noise floor raises up, and your signal floor is is lower. So you can uh, do multiple integrations. In other words, your image frame rate slows down, but then again, your car should slow down too. So there are various ways of doing it, um, but it's it, you know in general, your lidar system can see far better than you can, uh, but it is a noise floor problem. And the, the, so you basically use general signal processing and some graphics processing to also sort it out. There's the same problem if uh, your car is also driving into the sun. Uh, there's a, it, it actually creates a higher noise floor, even though that's not a bunch of coded pulses, it still makes things harder to see the reflected light. Yeah, adding to the, they are asking about aerospace application when you say, you're trying to estimate the ruins below the canopy. Uh, do they use LiDAR in space as well for any other application? Yeah, so uh, the first LiDAR application that I'm aware of was on Apollo 11, uh, the first moon landing. And they actually used a uh, LiDAR system uh, to determine the distance between the lunar uh, landing module and the, uh, the, the floor of the, of the moon. <laughs> Um, and it was a uh, silicon base, it was very primitive, it had poor resolution, but it got the job done. <laughs> um, so LiDAR has been around a long time. Uh, the, today, the modern use of LiDAR in space is, again, for landing of craft on, on Mars in particular, but also every time there's a dock with the International Space Station, there's a LiDAR system that's actually uh, autonomously moving the craft the, 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 the docking craft to the uh, ISS. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of those, particularly the Soyuz ones, have to be grabbed by an arm and then pulled in because they're very primitive. But in the modern ones, for example, the Dragon capsules and all of the SpaceX ones and all of the, the, uh, the other ones, uh, they all use a LiDAR system to dock. So since they have been used for a very long time, 
why we haven't uh, automotive manufacturers adopted them way sooner like it's exploding right now right in entrance was there so uh, you know as i mentioned in 19 in 2004 um, was really the the first example of a spinning lidar system which would give you a full 3d image it wasn't just using time of flight to determine the distance to a point uh, it was actually creating images and that was the genius of dave hall um, and uh, so that's relatively recent but using silicon in that system the resolution of that spinning lidar was not that much better than radar um, it had better features than radar collimation, which gave it better angular resolution, but it still was not that great. So Dave Hall was the, the person who first came, he came to, to me and said, I want to use GAN in LiDAR because I can then get from uh, meter type resolution to uh, centimeter type resolution. So it really was 2000 and I'd say 11 or 12 when GAN started getting used in LiDAR. So that's relatively quick, but we're still dealing clearly with dealing with the issue of the um, automation software and algorithms. How do you detect an object and how do you react to it properly? Yeah, related to software, one question is, uh, what is the uh, output of a LiDAR and what software is used to process? Uh, like, what is the format of the data generated by the LiDAR system? Um, so what's the output of the LiDAR unit? Um, uh, and I mean, I guess that means the, the, uh, the information output. Um, you the, the, the image, how is that yeah. uh, seen by the uh, yeah. processor? So the, the processor receives an XYZ coordinate. So inside the laser, the LiDAR system, everybody uh, has some kind of a um, analog input digital output that says my signals come in and I will give you an XYZ coordinate for where they are. Um, they have very interesting um, uh, features on them. For example, uh, a lot of these uh, new LiDAR units have auto calibration. So they can tell you exactly where they are in space and on the vehicle so that when there's a second LiDAR unit, uh, you know, one in the front, one in the back, they know where they are relative to each other exactly. And when there are like two of them that have overlapping images, they know exactly where they are. So the computer knows whether it's getting from the left unit or the right unit. All that aside, the LiDAR units give you X, Y, Z as their output. So three pieces of data in various different formats and the processors to absorb that information and turn it into a a command to the vehicle uh, tend to be very, very high-speed uh, GPUs. There's one from Mobileye, that's an Intel company. There's NVIDIA, which is the dominant one, and Tesla has their own proprietary processing units for that. Yeah. Uh, can you go to the picture where you show the photo of uh, the images uh, surrounding the car? Uh, I think it was... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here uh, uh, attendees want to know when you have so many sensors surrounding the car, uh, is it uh, is this image an integration of all the data, or uh, how do uh, is it from the rotate? Is it at the top? Is this is the image generated from the lidar at the top or at the front? How is this it? is a single spinning lidar on the roof of the car. That okay. that generates this image. So you can see you have a lot of the job is done. Uh, and that's why when I said there are three business models, people who really want to just make a, an autonomous car, they just stick one of these on the roof and most of the job is done. But then they got to fill in this, this shadow zone and, and that becomes the complexity. If you do it with flash LiDAR, you're integrating a bunch of XYZ coordinates. If you do it with cameras or ultrasonic image, uh, sensors, which is what Audi does, then you have a very expensive processing job of taking a camera and an ultrasonic sensor and then uh, basically combining that with a very dense digital point cloud, which is harder to do. And what are these images called? Are this LiDAR images or? It's just a 3D point cloud. That's what that is. Yeah. One. 
Uh, other question is also about uh, can LiDAR detect objects at different positions in the BRAC? And uh, what is the optimal LiDAR unit required for one vehicle? I think as you told, one at the top is good enough? Well, no, one at the top is not good enough because of the shadow zone. So, you know, you've got to fill in the shadow zone. Uh, now, I show an example where you fill it in with flash LiDAR. Uh, but if you go to the Audi system, um, let's see, I have it right here. Sorry. This one. You'll see that they have little shadows here showing all the zones and all the ways they, they, uh, um, they, uh, detect in that zone. So for example, in the uh, the red one in the front is the LiDAR system. That's the only one that's LiDAR. Uh, the gray one uh, on the side is, um, the dark gray is an ultrasonic sensor. Um, they have wide range ultrasonic sensors, which are the green. Uh, they have light gray here, which are cameras, which are used for, uh, for detection. Uh, so they're using, uh, and radar, radar is in the rear as well as uh, somewhere else, yeah, on the front. So they combine radar, LIDAR, cameras, and ultrasonic sensors. That's about mm -hmm. all you got. That's every. They threw everything at this. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I think there are no more questions, but I had a question. But we can live with the shadow zone, right? Because anyway, the shadow zone uh, seems very. Can you go back to the slide where you show the shadow zone? Yeah. Ah, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, how can we live with that shadow zone? Because anyway, vehicles we are dealing with vehicles, right? So, is it uh, worth putting so much sensors to remove that shadow? Well, I'd say that, that the driver can live with the shadow zone, but it's the people in the shadow zone that can't live with it. Um, but no, it's a critical thing. You have to cover the whole car. Um, for example, if you're doing a lane change, you need to know if there's something in the shadow zone uh, to make that lane change. Uh, so yes, it's, it's absolutely essential. You have to cover everything in the car. I think uh, that's it, Alex. Yeah, no more question. Yeah, I think you covered lots of points uh, during the Q&A. And yeah, uh, one last question. Uh, yeah, coming to power converter, uh, what are you looking at moving forward? DC, DC converters? Any I, I think that, yeah, I, you know, Logan is, is big in DC, DC converters. We're seeing, uh, changing architectures in computers uh, and things like that, and they're going away from silicon very rapidly going towards GAN devices. We sell millions and millions of GAN devices now into uh, the most advanced, uh, you know, leading edge systems out there. Uh, and, and that, of course, filters down to every system. Um, the, the big advancements in GAN are, are coming from integration. Uh, we now make a monolithic power stage where we integrate, uh, you know, a full half bridge with drivers, level shift logic, and all that kind of stuff, uh, all on one chip, uh, all in GAN. And, you know, that's getting more and more towards the full power system on a chip. And in silicon, you can't integrate multiple power devices. Uh, so with GAN, you can. And so I think that's where the, the big future is, um, full full power systems. And any products in the pipeline apart from the November release? So um, we have a, a whole series of these power stage products. We introduced the first one in, in March. Uh, it's the EPC 2152. Um, and we have a bunch of them coming out in uh, October, November, December, uh, along with a bunch of time of flight ICs. But I would make a general statement. And the general statement is in two more years, EPC will start will stop introducing discrete transistors, and all of the devices will have at least a driver function integrated onto them, okay. very, so that very. you, yeah. So it's just logic in and power out. That's that's the I'll say the 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 lowest level component will no longer be a discrete transistor. It will be a a power a, a logic in power out uh, device with logic and with with uh, drive capability as well. 
Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, sir, sir, I have a question what? if I may ask. Yeah, yeah, please go. Yeah, uh, sir, actually, uh, how much power does uh, this LiDAR system as a whole uh, take in? Because sub in future, we might be using electric vehicles, right? So the power has to be provided by just batteries. Uh, look, I, I, that's a very good question. Uh, and the, the answer depends on the exact implementation. Uh, if you use, you know, six LiDAR systems, it uses more power than if, if you use just one LiDAR system. Uh, if yeah. you use LiDAR and cameras, and that, so it, it's a wide range. Um, I, no. uh, I, I think that the, the spinning LiDAR sensors um, are running, you know, under 100 watts uh, today okay. for a high resolution. Um, and the, uh, the graphics processors are running a couple of hundred watts and, and up. So it's the computer that's really more uh, the, the problem of power than the sensors. Yeah, I got it. So and another thing is that, um, as you showed in, a, in one of your slides, uh, it was consuming a lot of uh, current, right? High current. Yes. So that transients would be very fast. Yeah, two and a half right? minutes. Yeah, so in which case a uh, battery can't act, it, it would uh, decrease, depreciate the lifespan of a battery. So an ultra capacitor bank might be used maybe? Well, these, these things just use ceramic capacitors to store the energy and fire it. Uh, what you oh. do is you actually store it up and it's, these are tiny capacitors actually, because this is a very, very short pulse. Uh, and uh, you, you're basically discharging a capacitor to get that very short pulse. By okay. charging capacitors, and discharging them, you also get around, you don't get around, but you, you address the eye safety problem because the capacitors can be charged up with a certain amount of charge and no matter what you do, you can't, <laughs> you can't fire more than that. Um, yeah. there, there are other topologies that use what are called dual edge control where you turn on and off a signal from a power rail and those are more dangerous because if they short on, it will fire the laser continuously and, and could hurt somebody. Got it. Thank you, sir. It was a very good presentation. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you very you, much. Thank you for waking up early and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you all for attending. If any other specific doubts, uh, you can email uh, Alex and he'll be more than happy to answer your question. So that's it, Alex. Thank you very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can't uh, wait soon enough for uh, EPC to release both uh, driver and the uh, GAN together. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.